Hello everyone, so again uh, welcome back to the uh, latest lecture session. So, today we are going to discuss or you know look at the aspects relevant to phytoremediation now, right. So, obviously as we discussed earlier you know bioremediation we look at aspects relevant to uh, both uh, the living organisms right or you know the living organisms. So, when we talk about living organisms we refer to both the microorganisms and plants let us say right. So, when we talk about phytoremediation typically you know we are also uh, you know uh, talking about uh, bioremediation too right, phytoremediation right. So, in this context of phytoremediation recently there was a particular uh, proposal that was put forth uh, from our particular side as in from a few departments at IIT Rurki to a particular national agency let us say for remediating a particular contaminated site. So, as part of or you know or in conjunction with some of the other remediation techniques we also suggested phytoremediation for a particular uh, what do we say uh, land let us say or set of uh, contaminated uh, uh, land let us say right. So, at that particular point in time you know the relevant person let us say from the agency you know was dismissively mentioning that phytoremediation you know you just uh, you know change phase from of the contaminant from one to the other, but you are not actually degrading that right. But you know that is a myth and even though uh, a part of that is true even that is uh, better than having the contaminant in the soil or the ground water and then being available for transport let us say to the relevant human uh, population let us say right. As in the relevant criticism was that uh, so rather than having the contaminant in the only in the soil now you are having it in the plant or such let us say right. So, that is what the relevant uh, you know issue was. But again rather than having it in, la in the land or contaminating the ground water you can have it in another phase let us say where it is relatively immobile that is obviously within the plant let us say. But it is not as if that it is just change in phase you are also going to have uh, degradation let us say or transformation of the relevant compounds. So, obviously we are going to look at some of those aspects in a bit more detail let us say right. So, when we talk about phytoremediation we obviously need to look at the mechanisms let us say right. What are the different mechanisms? right and so typically we have uh, what do we have one based on degradation and one based on maybe accumulation if I may say so right. So, let us look at degradation first right again they are self explanatory obviously you know one you are actually in one case you are actually degrading the relevant contaminant and the other maybe you can think of either immobilizing it or just accumulating it in one particular uh, zone let us say or let us say seeing to, seeing to it that relevant compound is not available for transport. So, within the context of uh, degradation you have uh, phyto and rhizo let us say right. So, when I talk about uh, phyto I am referring to the relevant uh, uptake of the uh, uh, contaminant right through the root zone and such let us say right into the relevant stem, leaf and the root let us say right. And within this particular plant let us say degradation or transformation of the relevant product uh, takes place let us say right. So, that is uh, with respect to uh, phyto degradation let us say right. So, that is what we have, but what is this uh, rhizo degradation let us say that we have out here. So, this obviously as the name indicates is in occurs in the rhizosphere let us say right or in the root zone of the plant let us say. As in if you have your root zone let us say if this is the subsurface and you have all your roots and such out here right. So, there is a particular what do we say zone around the roots let us say where the condition conditions are relatively more favorable for the microbes to thrive let us say right. So, maybe around 1 mm away from these particular 1 mm now right away from these particular roots let us say right that particular zone let us say is remarkably conducive typically let us say for microbes to thrive why is that you have uh, what do we say uh, the uh, excudates from the relevant uh, roots or the plants let us say they can be sugars let us say right different acids let us say right or such aspects or enzymes let us say from the relevant plants right 
that can aid in or you know promote the uh, growth of these relevant uh, microbes let's say or con create conditions that let the microbes thrive let's say right. So, here it is not that the plant is directly involved in degrading the relevant uh, contaminant, but that it creates conditions for bioremediation to take place or the degradation to take place by the microbes let us say right. So, that is the uh, one rhizodegradation if I may say so right. So, in, in phyto the plant itself is actually degrading the relevant contaminant after taking it in right and it is present it as in the contaminant can be present either in the stem leaf or the relevant root and the relevant transformation can be you know taking place let us say right. In the root zone obviously as we discussed that there are other aspects let us say right. So, there are different aspects too as in sometimes you can choose the tree such that you know uh, you know there is no uptake of the contaminant as in the contaminant does not go into the root stem or leaf, but only that you know the relevant rhizodegradation is promoted let us say. There are some such trees that you can choose, but obviously there is no one tree that you can choose for all contaminants. There are some particular trees that have shown some affinity at in particular soils and climate conditions for some kinds of uh, you know uh, contaminants or such let us say right. And another aspect is that the, here the limitation is that as you can see right, if the degradation is occurring at great depths is this rel uh, relatively feasible not really why is that? Obviously, the biodegradation will only take place within the root depth let us say or you know to the extent to which the roots can uh, penetrate or such let us say. So, the time required for the roots to penetrate to the relevant locations or even the depths to which the roots can uh, penetrate to right that is a major limiting factor or aspect out here let us say right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, let us move on to accumulation let us say right. So, one again is uh, phyto is phyto extraction right and the other is rhizo filtration or phyto filtration let us say right. So, again here keep in mind that the relevant aspect is that the compound is not being degraded, but that it is being accumulated let us say right. So, typically what is the issue now if I have pollutant all around in this room let us say that is an issue because all the relevant uh, people that might occupy this room will be exposed to the contaminant. But if I have some way that I can you know accumulate all this particular contaminant that is dispersed throughout th this room let us say, but the dispersion is such that you know the co concentration is still toxic enough. So, if I can accumulate all this in one particular location let us say I can limit the relevant effects of the toxicity let us say right. So, in that case uh, we have accumulation and we are going to look at phyto extraction. So, in this context obviously as I mentioned you have accumulators or hypo or hyper accumulators let us say right. So, some of these uh, uh, trees let us say have a great affinity for some uh, particular compounds typically let us say a few metals let us say right. As in you know some plants let us say take in heavy metals a few heavy metals let us say at uh, concentrations that are almost 100 times or 1000 times more than other plants that you would typically observe for those same contaminants now right. Again the reason is not uh, clear, but I think related to reduced effects of toxicity or such let us say in the relevant zone. So, that is one particular aspect, but again you know uh, there is no such one plant that will you know thrive in all conditions, but there are some plants with respect to these hyper accumulators let us say that have been uh, you know known to accumulate as many as 8 heavy metals at very high concentrations. But sadly you know chromium looks like is not one of those. Uh, uh, heavy metals that is taken up by these hyper accumulators let us say and the reason we mentioned chromium is you know you have considerable issues with uh, chromium uh, contamination at various sites let us say right. But again you have some of these hyper accumulators. So, the other than that you still have you know these non hyper accumulators if I may say so non hyper accumulators let us say as in typical plants too will take in uh, some of these relevant uh, contaminants and such and so on and accumulate them either in the root or plant or uh, such let us say right. So, again here it is not a degradation that is occurring that is something to uh, keep in mind now right. So, but one aspect is that you will also need to look at the bioavailability of the relevant contaminant as in let us say sometimes you conduct tests as in let us say you conduct uh, you know I think these are called hydroponic let us say right. You have the plants let us say in the trees or you know plants pardon me in uh, floating around in water let us say you conduct the relevant tests and you see that most of the contaminant out here 
in the relevant water was accumulated in the relevant plant let us say right. But when you try to replicate that on the actual site that is not uh, going through why is that because here you know the tests were hydroponic let us say right the contaminant was in water but out there you know the contaminant let us say it might be adsorbed onto the soil or might be very much you know deeply you know or reach the interior of the relevant soil let us say. So, it is not available for uptake by the relevant uh, uh, relevant plant or the relevant root let us say right. So, sometimes you can add chelating agents let us say to make the relevant uh, compound more mobile or such so that it can be taken in by the relevant root system or such let us say right. So, and again keep in mind that there are different uh, factors let us say at play, but one factor uh, that gives us an idea about uh, you know this particular uptake or accumulation is uh, one where you look at the concentration in the relevant root to the concentration in the relevant uh, soil let us say of the relevant compound obviously concentration of the relevant compound in the root or the plant to the concentration of the relevant compound in the soil and typically it is around 50 for some 10 for some heavy metals and so on and so forth though. So, you get some idea about uh, you know the relevant aspects here right. So, again that is with respect to phyto extraction and then obviously we are talking about rhizofiltration I will write that out here. So, rhizofiltration or phytofiltration let us say right. Right here again uh, we are concerned with uh, you know the contaminant that is in the ground water as in uh, or in the water let us say. Uh, phyto extraction we are concerned with the contaminant that is you know on the soil or adsorbed onto the soil and such and uh, rhizofiltration or such we are concerned with the contaminant that is in the water let us say right. Again you know the contaminant can be transformed into such forms that it is immobilized or it precipitates out onto the or it precipitates out onto the relevant roots or such let us say or the conditions are transformed such that you know the contaminant is not available for uh, transport or such let us say right that we are going to refer to as uh, rhizofiltration or phytofiltration right. So, another aspect let us say is dissipation or maybe even uh, we can sometimes I think call this phyto volatilization maybe let us say right. So, you have some forms of mercury let us say that are uh, reduced to this particular form let us say right or you know there are other compounds let us say like maybe TCE let us say semi volatile. So, some of these compounds let us say that are uh, you know let us say especially TCE let us say is semi volatile. So, while it is transformed within the relevant plant let us say once it is taken in some of it is also dissipated through the relevant uh, leaf now right. The leaf has some surface area again that is open to the relevant atmosphere or the gaseous phase. So, the contaminant can change phase from the relevant uh, what is this now uh, leaf into the relevant gaseous phase let us say. So, rather than being in the soil and may be available for transport let us say right and again as you know these hydrophobic contaminants right these uh, contaminants such as TC are remarkably difficult to remove. So, here you are changing phase to from one to the other, but again keep in mind that you know though the effects or the concentrations in the gaseous phase or in the atmosphere would not be as high as you would uh, and thus the toxics will not be toxic effects will not be as high as you would expect if the TC was to stay in the soil or the ground water you still are only changing the phase, but not completely degrading that that is something to uh, keep in mind let us say right. So, we have that particular aspect dissipation. So, other aspect is also immobilization as in your particular you know uh, plants or uh, such let us say are going to change the characteristics of the soil let us say such that the relevant contaminants there end up being immobile. So, this can be brought about by you know uh, stabilization let us say of the relevant soil again we are looking at physical chemical or biological changes or typically physical and chemical changes that affect the soil properties let us say. And then during this particular process the relevant compounds can be adsorbed onto the relevant soil or even the roots let us say or you know precipitation can occur and so on and so forth right and these are the major aspects as in what are the major aspects one is degradation based let us say one is accumulation based and the other dissipation and the other immobilization right. So, four major aspects typically that we have looked at now right. So, we are now going to look at one uh, minor case study right. So, let us look at what I have here. So, the references that we looked at let us say for getting the relevant data are from the US EPA the title being cost and performance report. So, again this is available in the public domain you can access that other is from the USGS let us say right or US geological survey 
and this is from demonstration or site development and phytoremediation process associated with TCE trichloroethene. This is something we have faced a lot in groundwater at a naval air station, joint reserve base in Texas, let us say, right. Again, these are the documents that we use to uh, develop the relevant presentation, right. Again, they are available in the public domain. So, obviously, phytoremediation. So, here they were trying to look at removing organics and metals and there is something maybe I have discussed earlier, but what are some of the relevant compounds that can be removed by your particular phytoremediation or degraded or immobilized or such. Some of them are heavy metals obviously, some uh, inorganics, but considerable fraction of organics let us say or considerable organics, pesticides and many times the phytoremediation let us say has been widely uh, what do we say employed or deployed at you know these army bases or munitions bases let us say or munition depots as in where they hold the uh, munitions let us say or, or ammunition there you have contamination and that is where they looked at this particular phytoremediation widely let us say and you know these are some of the kinds let us say BTEX let us say right these are different compounds that are have been you know looked at or you know where uh, phytoremediation has been typically successful let us see. So, in this context we are looking at organics and some metals. So, again you know the major aspect with phytoremediation is that it can be combined with other remediation efforts or in conjunction with the other efforts right. Obviously, you are just not just you are trying to plant certain kinds of trees or you know trees that are naturally occurring out there and then increase biodegradation or you know immobilization of the relevant contaminant let us say right. So, typically let us say they are also looked at with respect to non-reactive barriers let us say or with pump and treat let us say right. So, we have the relevant contaminant is way out there let us say you know uh, in the, uh, the if the depth is too, way too high let us say obviously, the root cannot penetrate to that particular depth or it takes time. So, typically pump and treat is used to you know pump out that water let us say that is relatively far off from the root zone. And also you know phytoremediation is looked at uh, for the relevant uh, uh, contamination in the relevant soil or in the shallow regions let us say right. So, that is something to keep in mind and non-reactive barriers typically slurry walls we might have or we will discuss these aspects or, or we have discussed these aspects rather right. So, are used so that the contaminant is not transported off site and is available for the plant for degradation and so on and so forth right. So, in this case what are some of the uh, aspects that they looked at. Again in this naval base considerable what do we say amount of TCE plume was present or contamination was present and from that you had a plume. So, here what are they looking at one is transpiration and phyto containment effects let us say right. So, again transpiration from the trees induces a cone of depression that is something that they looked at here let us say right and the second aspect is stimulation for microbial degradation this is something we do looked at as in in the zone around the relevant roots. What do they mention the plant roots excrete compounds that is something we discussed obviously different enzymes and so on that also contain organic carbon which is also used as a food source let us say. We looked at enzymes typically or obviously you know for biodegradation to take place you need an electron acceptor and doser even if you do not have one of them you know your relevant process is not going to take place. So, the obviously these roots can or the plants can provide one of these uh, aspects let us say maybe the electron donor in this particular case to allow for relevant bioremediation let us say right. So, that is one aspect and then phytodegradation right trees you know uh, have their own systems metabolic process and during that time uh, or during those process they can break down the TCE or stabilization plants bind contaminated soils in place which result in immobilization of toxic contaminants right. So, that is something again we discussed or phytovolatilization right. So, in this context uh, when they were looking at this particular uh, field uh, or pilot scale study on the field these were the 5 aspects that they discussed as you see these are the you know the usual cases that we looked at earlier too right and this is what we have from the particular site. So, this is the relevant site here you have the contaminated plume and I believe the ground water is flowing in this particular direction there were some reasons for this particular uh, uh, lobe though right this is the central lobe southern lobe and northern lobe though this is a naval or and uh, pardon me an air force base as they mentioned here right. So, this is the contaminated plume and you have a contamination or the contaminated plume I know or a wide area obviously right. So, let us look at that this particular plant was adjacent to also a naval air station let us say right a US air force base adjacent to a naval air, uh, air force uh, or air station. 
sustained contamination through the use of chlorinated solvents TCE and where were they used in the manufacture and assembly of military aircraft let us say right. So, they were used widely during these manufacture and assembly. So, the plant was constructed in 1942 and it still produces their I think premium and F-16 aircraft right radar units and so on. So, they have generated almost 6000 tons of waste per year including you know these kinds of waste ok and these waste were disposed on site landfills some may be uh, you know with impermeable layers some may be not or burned during uh, training exercise let us say right. So, even when you burn you might have air pollution or even the residue let us say might uh, leach out let us say right. So, that is one aspect to keep in mind. So, first aspects of contamination were noted in 1982 and then the transport of TCE obviously as we looked at earlier created a huge plume of contaminated ground water right. So, pump and treat was looked at for one particular uh, lobe let us say which was the southern lobe and steam enhanced vacuum extraction was also tried for and address only a part though right. Obviously, pump and treat especially for TC or those compounds we looked at these relevant calculations. So, you have what do we say the compound adsorbed onto the soil because it is still relatively hydrophobic let us say right and also keep in mind that uh, you know before I forget talking about this phytoremediation will it be applicable to remarkably hydrophobic compounds or moderately hydrophobic compounds. So, obviously, only for moderately hydrophobic compounds or relatively you know not uh, compounds that have very high KOW values why is that because if it is very hydrophobic it will be strongly adsorbed onto soil and it will not be taken up by or it will not be easily taken up by the relevant plant let us say right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, again coming back to what we were discussing. So, we were when we are uh, when they were trying to address or we looked at the calculations too hydrophobic compound let us say considerable fraction of the uh, contaminant will be adsorbed onto soil. So, pump and treat is not a great option, but it looks like they tried that right and also steam enhanced vacuum extraction let us say they addressed only a part of that. So, in 1996 a field uh, uh, scale or not field scale a pilot scale field demonstration was looked at with respect to phytoremediation over a 70 meter wide portion of the central lobe of the relevant plume and which approximately is 1.5 kilometers of gradient of the demonstration area let us say right. So, let us look at that particular aspect. So, this is where they have the this is the central uh, plume let us say or lobe and this is where they looked at uh, the phytoremediation let us say right. So, obviously, as you see the concentrations are more or less from 50 to uh, 500 uh, micrograms per uh, liter let us say right of TCE now. Once you have TCE obviously, you will have other compounds too, but here they are primarily looking at TCE now right. So, that is something to keep in mind. So, let us look at what we have here. So, here uh, they have clay, sand and gravel. So, what does that mean that you know it is relatively the hydraulic conductivity or the permeability will be very or relatively high. As you can see hydraulic conductivity 6 meters per day that is relatively high and saturated aquifer thickness you know not uh, too high average gradient again 2 percent depth to ground water not a lot and again as I mentioned towards southeast that is where that is the direction of the ground water flow. And again let us say ground water velocity as we mentioned earlier was uh, or you know based on the hydraulic conductivity obviously you know that u is equal to k i and k is relatively high thus u is also relatively high let us say right and uh, the reason being that uh, you have clay sands and uh, gravel let us say right. Again let us look at what they have. So, investigation of the ability of a particular kind of trees to remediate shallow contaminated ground water in a particular kind of uh, climate. So, the determination of the ability of the planted system or the kind of uh, plants that they looked at what were they trying to look at to hydraulically control the migration of contaminated ground water. So, more or less immobilization or preventing transport of the contaminant from off site or to off site let us say and also to enhance the biological. Uh, capacity of the relevant subsoil to remediate this particular contaminant right. What do we have biologically enhance the subsurface environment to optimize in situ reductive dechlorination of the chlorinated ethenes let us say right. So, you have TCE right and uh, what do we say 1, 2 DCE, VC and so on let us say. So, the particular emphasis seems to be upon let us say or at least their objectives were to see if by uh, planting the relevant trees they can you know fasten this particular bioremediation let us say right. So, again two plantations let us say I believe at two plantations and total of a considerable area 4000 meter square area and they looked at 660 eastern cotton woods let us say right. Let us look at what we have out here. 
So, types of cotton wood they looked at two types if I am not wrong one is whips as in one year old were transported obviously you cannot pl start planting the seeds out there because it takes time obviously you are going to transport and replant the relevant uh, trees out here right or the saplings at least at least the trees. So, one year old cottonwood stems were planted in one plantation and in the other relatively more mature stems were planted in another uh, what we say plantation one for whips and one from uh, caliper trees let us say and they are more or less eastern cost, uh, cottonwood uh, trees. And one of the reasons looks like why they chose caliper trees was that looks like it will have or is supposed to have higher evapotranspiration why is that because of larger leaf area let us say or larger leaf mass let us say right. So, let us look at one particular trial so this is one particular plantation let us say the caliper tree plantation where they were uh, looking at this particular pilot scale demonstration let us say right. So, this is the actual uh, picture from the relevant site right. And okay, monitoring system. So, considerable level of monitoring system is uh, you know processes are required, right? Obviously, why is that? Now you are looking at what do we say uh, passive techniques, right? So, obviously, monitoring is in a very important aspect out here. So, obviously, up gradient, within and down gradient. So, continuous water level recorders, obviously, because they were also looking at uh, whether the uh, to see, let's say, these particular plantations can look at hydraulic control, let's say. So, that is why they have these particular uh, continuous water level recorders right. 9 tensiometers install up gradient or within the tree plantations let us say weather station 2 stream gauge let us say right and tree collars or tree probes to measure the sap flow in the selected sea trees let us say because that is one of the ways let us say the relevant uh, containment is going to be transported through the relevant trees let us say right. So, that is one aspect. So, location of cottonwood plantations and monitoring wells let us say at the phytoremediation site. So, these were the two what we say sites of plantations one the whip and one the caliper based plantation or caliper plantation and they also had some cottonwood or pre existing cottonwoods out here. So, as you can see the considerable number of uh, uh, what we say monitoring wells up gradient, down gradient and within the plantations out here right. So, up gradient down gradient and within the plantations right. So, that is what you see out here and also some near the relevant uh, surface water body. So, let us look at the data assessment here changes in the TC mass flux. So, the baseline right. So, we have different columns out here right as in hydraulic gradient right. So, there is some decrease obviously as you can see in the hydraulic gradient let us say some not a lot right. Again cross sectional area down this that is a slight decrease we are not going to that in great detail let us say. But the major aspect is volumetric flux of the ground water across a down gradient and of the planted area right. So, if you are looking for hydraulic control obviously it should decrease. So, there is some or slight decrease let us say and that I think corresponds to the peak growing season let us say right. Obviously, your trees are going to have based on the season of the year a peak growing season let us say right. I think here it is June or July for these particular climates and in this particular peak let us say they as you can see the maximum what do we say hydraulic control let us say must achieve let us say or the, the change in volumetric flux let us say was maximum let us say in that particular peak let us say. But typically you see that there was a decrease in this particular volumetric flux of ground water. Why is that important? That means that your transport of the relevant contaminant is being arrested or inhibited let us say right. And also average concentration of TCE may be not a great deal to understand here, but mass flux of TCE let us say across this particular case again you know the data is relatively limited, but they were trying to show that there was a decrease in the mass flux let us say right, but again data is limited though. But obviously, we have other data concentrations in the tree samples with microgram per kg for the first 3 years let us say right. So, let us look at the uh, 2 kinds whips and calipers that were planted and already mature cotton wood was already present there and we are looking at TCE and 1 2 DCE for all these relevant uh, compounds let us say not comp yeah for all these 3 kinds of uh, trees let us say right. And we are looking at leaf stem and root for all these relevant aspects. So, let us look at one set of data. So, here for whips you see that in October 1997 a particular concentration of TCE was recorded in the particular uh, tree in the stem let us say and relatively higher out there in the later years let us say right. So, again uh, keep in mind that you know this is one uh, what do we say uh, proof that you know the contaminant is at least being taken up by the relevant uh, tree, 
but to look at let us say is degradation taking place or just accumulation or such we need to look at other aspects, but we are not going to that in that detail because we do not have as much data. So, same case with calipers and such may be a lot more actually right caliper seems to be doing a greater job, but I think the season is playing a considerable role or this decrease might be attributed to the relevant compound being transformed or degraded by the relevant plant itself, but again we need more data though again here this is how you have more data out here. So, biologically induced reductive dechlorination as in one of the aspects that the people want to look at was let us say is the subsurface now more conducive for uh, you know this reductive dechlorination. So, let us look at what we have. So, microbial data from soil and groundwater samples have indicated that the community between that is now more or less more diverse let us say or is you know moving towards a more diverse assemblage let us say or you know multi what do we say uh, uh, you have different kinds of microbes if I can say so that can support the you know reductive dechlorination let us say right or you know to put it differently let us say planting these uh, trees let us say has transformed the system such that you know more reducing conditions prevails that will allow for relevant microbes to prevail that can bring about reductive dechlorination now right. So, that is what we have out here. So, again what do we have here now these microbes can uh, support both hydrogen oxidizing methanogens and also estate fermenting methanogens right. Typically let us say these are indicators of you know conditions let us say which will allow for reactive dechlorination of the relevant contaminants and I think that is something we looked at earlier let us say right. So, we are now going to move on to average TCE to 1 to DC ratios in the aquifer let us say right. So, TCE to 1 to DCE right. So, again different trends out here based on the relevant uh, uh, what do we say season right, but let us look at upgradient right. This is the upgradient profile and then let us look at down gradient right the down gradient is somewhere out here let us say right the down gradient profile as you see with time let us say there is some improvement let us say in the relevant aspect, but again keep in mind we are looking at TCE to DCE ratios let us say right TCE to DCE ratios right. So, again it will be indicative of some level of uh, what do we say degradation or such let us say again that is the same case with uh, you know different aspects or such as in if this is lower what does that mean now TC is being degraded to DC let us say right that is what we see out here let us say right. Again if it would have been better if we had actual concentrations of TC and DC at the site, but we did not have that we have what we have some proof that you know the transformation is taking place because 1 to DC is a byproduct of TC now right. So, let us move on. So, some of the groundwater chemistry parameters. So, we are looking at upgradient beneath the plantation and down gradient of the plantations and also beneath the mature cottonwood trees now right. So, here we have dissolved oxygen nitrate, so O2 and O3 minus and ferrous and alternative let us say right. So, again these aspects though if you look at it they will give an idea about let us say are the conditions more oxidizing or reducing. So, upgradient you have considerable levels of DO nitrate and very less amount of ferrous iron let us say which is a reducing agent this is a reducing agent these are oxidizing agents let us say right. So, you for your reductive dechlorination to take place your oxygen or NO3 minus should be relatively low. As you can see beneath the plantations at least the transformation is taking place as in as you go further down the DO is decreasing the nitrate is decreasing let us say right and your ferrous iron concentrations are increasing out here right. So, that is what you see as in the conditions are slowly transforming into more reducing conditions let us say right and only in the reducing conditions when there is no competing electron acceptor will you have what we say reductive dechlorination of your relevant compounds. Why is that? Because if you have oxygen the microbe does not want to use oxygen what we say TCE or want to DCE as the electron acceptor right because it will guess get let less energy let us say right. So, let us move on. So, tree height and trunk uh, measurements obviously you know we have need more data, but obviously you can see that the height increases let us say and also the trunk diameter increases. But one aspect that this can be used to look at is that when we looked at the concentration of the contaminant in the relevant tree or stem let us say we saw that initially there was considerable increase and there is slight decrease. The slight decrease is also attributed to the fact that now your tree is relatively bigger let us say right. So, the concentration will be slightly lower. So, that does not mean that you know uh, the relevant contaminant is not being taken up, 
but it is just that you know the tree mass is more let us say right. But again we need to be careful when we draw such conclusions though, right. So, some basic cost information, so site characterization you know some amount right not a lot typically though site design, site work most of it is or goes into the monitoring wells let us say this is the actual cost right 90,000 dollars go into the you know the monitoring aspects let us say and again the weather station and the survey I guess let us say a considerable amount but primarily with respect to the monitoring let us say right. And then purchase of the trees but here obviously the costs are relatively high but let us say in the Indian context they will obviously not be very high let us say right. So, here the costs are somewhat higher. So, installation of the irrigation system again higher Indian cases it will not be very high. So, total co capital cost is 1 lakh 93,000. 200 rupee uh, not 200 I guess 200 dollars now right. So, again as you can see for considerable fraction of the relevant uh, system and where they have keep in mind this is pilot scale. So, they will put in more and monitoring networks and so on the costs are relatively less here let us say right. So, let us look at what we have. So, we have operational maintenance as in just minor landscaping. So, here though we are going to look at again considerable cost with respect to monitoring the relevant uh, uh, variables here. What are the variables let us say ground water, soil vegetation, transpiration, climate and so on right. So, we need to monitor these aspects to understand their effects on the relevant phytoremediation let us say right. So, the total annual or operational maintenance comes to 2 lakh and 52 thousand right dollars and after treatment obviously none let us say right. So, again one aspect to keep in mind here is that you cannot just remove the trees and expect this process to go through right. The trees need to typically stay in place for this process to be uh, sustainable now. But as you can see though let us say the costs are relatively less and once this can be or is implemented in full scale let us say the effects are typically you know uh, exponentially better let us say right. Because as you can see it gets better as you move uh, down gradient and again you know larger the area typically the better the performance let us say right. So, I guess with that I will end uh, today's session and uh, thank you.